I, I come from uh, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, this shirt is from the Kalamazoo Civic Theater. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you remember ever going to Kalamazoo by any chance? No, but I think that I've been through Kalamazoo. Okay. It's a hell of a name. And how about that uh, song? From Kalamazoo. Da, 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 da. Wasn't there a song like that? A lady, uh, I know a, a gal from Kalamazoo. I know, yeah. I know a gal from Kalamazoo. Zoo, 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 zoo. Yeah. So wonderful. What the heck was his name? He did such wonderful impersonations of like Clark Gable and, uh, and or, or like when he pretended he broke your arm. He's like, oh, my poor arm. I think you yeah. broke it. Yes. That was so funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I've made 365 pictures. But everybody starts. Right. Everybody's an amateur before they get going. There they go. It's the All Radio Hog Jowls Black Eyed Peas and Turnip Greens Good Luck You All New Year's Day Parade. It's a classic. I'd be happy to. I'd never get tired of this slide. It was the All Radio Hog Jowls Black Eyed Peas and Turnip Greens Good Luck You All New Year's Day Parade. It was all fictitious, but it wasn't in the minds of the viewers. One of the things that, that uh, was Hugh's idea, that we would have a club that would have no dues, no constitution, no bylaws, no formal meetings, that it would be just a very casual get together to talk and, and, and hear and, and look at some of the old events of old time radio and bring back some wonderful memories and uh, be entertained along the way. One of the problems that we have, and we, we try to provide full disclosure, but we're, we're trying to emulate a radio program that might have existed in the 1920s and 1930s or 1940s. And we have call letters, we have a WOTR, it stands for W, old, wonderful old time radio. And uh, people will stop me on the street or people will come to our meeting and they'll say, I've been trying to get you, I go to your call letters and I can't find you. And what I try to do when I do my segment is I, I hold up the microphone and I say, we are unplugged because it's, it's not plugged into anything. But some people think we're an actual radio program, but that's, that's not what we are and, and uh, we don't want to mislead anybody. But uh, uh, some people don't always uh, attend all the meetings, so they're wondering how they can get us on their radio. Kalur, he owned a radio station in Tryon. You know how long he owned that station? I don't. Anyway, it was for a while. He made up an 18 minute long program, a uh, Happy New Year type thing. And what, what is the name of it? It's the All Radio Hog Jowls Black Eyed Peas and Turnip Greens Good Luck You All New Year's Day Parade. It's a classic. He, uh, he broadcast that at noontime, and he said that um, after the program was over, it came on at 12 o'clock, and he said he got telephone calls from people who wanted to know where the parade was. <laughs> and they went down, it was in Columbus, and they, which was about four miles from Tryon, and he said people called him, they said they couldn't find the parade. So it was very believable. I might mention that Dick Briggs, uh, one of the, 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 the new additions to our club, he came up with our first sponsor, and this is a classic, Bubba's Bootleg Bombshell Brew, it's good for you. Bubba's Bootleg Bombshell Brew, it's good for you. A favorite in the area. 
I enjoy radio because it, it really causes you to create in your own mind. Television doesn't do that. Television does that for you. But I, I'm not getting, I'm not making a lot of money at it, are we? <laughs> but you can't, uh, you, you can't replace uh, the enjoyment that we are having with it. Well, this, he, this guy's so modest. He's got, and I've seen his collection. He's got over 3,000 programs in his library. And it's still growing, right? Oh, well, <laughs> I guess. One of the things that, uh, uh, the, that I enjoy uh, probably as much as anything is to look out in that audience, because I'm facing the audience, and I'll see a couple that might be in their 80s and they're holding hands. And uh, every once in a while, I want to lean over to say something to the other one. They'll smile and they'll get a good, good feeling. And I said, because my friends sometimes say, well, why do you do that? You're not getting paid for it. And I said, that's not the point. I said, my pay is coming from the people that are coming to the program and, and having a good time and recalling some old memories. And uh, that's very satisfying. I've always said to Hugh, I said, as long as there's one person willing to come listen to me, I'm ready to do a show for him. I saw Edgar Bergen perform when I was a little boy. So he, he was wonderful and he gave birth to a beautiful daughter. He was pretty great, Edgar Bergen. So, what made him great? Well, if you're a bad ventriloquist, everybody knows right away. And I actually thought Charlie McCarthy, right? Am I right? Yeah, I actually thought Charlie McCarthy was real when I was little. So there you go. Edgar executed a will making Charlie McCarthy the beneficiary of a $10,000 trust fund, quote, to forever care for and keep Charlie McCarthy in good and serviceable condition and repair. By 1945, Edgar's weekly salary was $10,000, and he earned $150,000 for each movie. Additionally, Edgar earned $75,000 a year from Charlie McCarthy toys, games, and jewelry. Squads of policemen were needed to clear a path through the sea, the sea of fans. Come on and talk to me, Charlie. I can't sleep. I never sleep. I can't even close my eyes. I know. I haven't been able to work that out yet. Oh, there's a lot you haven't been able to work out yet. Edgar had accomplished world popularity. But sometimes, Edgar felt incomplete. He often stated that he was a foil and that fans much preferred Charlie McCarthy as opposed to the man maneuvering the controls. 60% of Edgar's fan mail was actually sent to Charlie, and on many occasions, Edgar was mistakenly addressed as Mr. McCarthy. An invitation letter from the White House was sent to the dummy, and when Edgar was being introduced to Eleanor Roosevelt, she shook Charlie's hand. During parties or special events, if Edgar showed up alone, then crowds were disappointed. Edgar found humor in this dynamic, exploiting it for publicity. But it was a true dynamic. Edgar and Charlie were radio stars and had been most comfortable and compelling on radio or stage. Sometimes during movie productions, they worked dejectedly. In the moments prior to filming, Edgar would hear the words, quiet on the set. So, during his ventriloquist act, crowd reactions were non-existent. No cheers, nothing for him to monitor as to whether he was being funny enough.
May I have Charlie's autograph? This is forgery, you know. Charlie may sue me. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bergen. Oh, I'm not Mrs. Bergen. I'm Mrs. McCarthy. Sometimes actors feel lonely when performing in front of thousands, especially with family and friends absent from the crowd. Of course, Edgar Bergen was outgoing and well-liked. He had scores of good friends, including Cary Grant and Walt Disney. And Edgar Bergen had a strong attachment to Decatur. According to some of Edgar's Decatur neighbors, who were children during Bergen's lifetime and are now in their 80s and 90s, Edgar often landed his private plane at the airport in nearby Lawton, Michigan, and then drove a few miles to his old Decatur neighborhood. Reportedly, Edgar did so on numerous occasions to visit friends and enjoy time on the farms. Decatur was the site of his original mentors and friends, where elders were the wisest, authority familiar, and acceptance most desired. When I look at a picture of my grandfather and Edgar here on the front porch, all of those memories, to the extent they existed, about Edgar moving from college onto the boards, as they say, must have been quickly forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> he must have said, well, that was then, and this is now. He was the son, and really not the prodigal son by that point, when he came back to Decatur, at least when I was in that house and in residence under the same roof with him and my grandparents, it was a joyous type of occasion. You know, lots of fun, lots of excitement. <laughs> 